what joy it is to sing praises to our amazing and wonderful God. I'm excited this morning to be introducing a new series in our study of God's Word. I've had this little book on my heart for a long time, the letter that Paul wrote to the Colossians. If you want to find that in your copy of the Scripture, we'll begin in chapter 1. And we'll only read his greeting to the church this morning as the text for our morning message. This little letter is sometimes a little bit overlooked. Uh, people get really engaged with Ephesians and Philippians and then the pastoral epistles. Sometimes Galatians, we get kind of bogged down in it. Then we jump over to Ephesians and Philippians and they're so rich. But this particular letter is rich, rich in its Christology. It talks so highly about Jesus and we want to always learn more and grow more in our knowledge of Jesus. So we're going to study this book together over the weeks and months ahead. So listen and read with me in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The Christian experience while centered on the person and work of the Lord Jesus, is fleshed out or lived out practically in the context and in the culture of the church. So it is absolutely crucial that the church is fashioned in such a way that it follows the model that's set forth in Scripture. So it behooves us to visit and then revisit and then revisit again the way that Scripture lays out what church life is meant to look like. The biblical foundation for ecclesiology was largely developed and recorded through the ministry and the writings of the Apostle Paul. In the letters that he penned to the churches, we find some of the things that he said in his greeting that are repeated over and over. Now, you have to understand something. We have this compilation of the various letters that Paul wrote. But if you were one of the churches that was receiving that letter, you would not have had the other letters that Paul wrote. So you would be reading this as if this was just to you. So whenever we read in the, the book of Ephesians and the book of Philippians, the book of Galatians, the book of Colossians, those greetings that Paul made to the churches, what we need to understand is that they didn't see that over and over and over again. But Whenever Paul was writing these documents, he stated these things over and over again. And in his providence and in his wisdom, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God has preserved for us these statements over and over again. Why do you think he did that? Do you think God does something just to have something to do? Absolutely not. Whenever God does something, there is reason and purpose behind it every single time. So when we see these repeated words by the Apostle Paul, God has given them to us to help us understand some things about ourselves, about His church, that we need desperately to understand. So when we read these greetings and we see that they say very, things very similar to those words that are written in other letters, we need to understand that God has preserved them and given them to us because and, and actually repeated them because he wants us to get it. Whenever you are in the process of trying to teach someone something, one of the greatest methods for teaching is repetition. Any of you ever had to repeat anything to your kids or your grandkids to help them get it? Anybody? No? Yes? Everybody has. Because that's the way we teach. We repeat things over and over. So God is trying to teach us something about himself and about ourselves through these words of repetition that we see over and over again. He wanted the church to become aware of the truth of the things that are spoken in these introductory comments to these letters. And so these comments will guide our thinking during the message this morning that is entitled, The Church As It Should Be. So we're going to call this basically an introduction to life in the early church. The early church, from, from the book of Acts forward, models for us what healthy church life is meant to look like. 
And, and everybody would want to have a healthy church life. So whenever Paul writes, he says these words, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Now, whenever he writes these words in that verse, he actually is beginning by giving them some thoughts and some ways to understand God's established leadership within the body of Christ. He, his statement of personal introduction includes some very important designations. He begins by identifying himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. An apostle. That word in and of itself designates an element of authority, an element of leadership that God has assigned. And so whenever you begin to read about the early church, you can read about the various apostles. And the word apostle is a word that literally means one sent under the authority of another. And so whenever Paul writes these words, he's saying, I am an apostle. I am someone that has been sent to you. I'm someone that has been sent on behalf of someone else. So I'm here to share something with you that someone has sent me to share. And so Paul is explaining to them his role, his designation as an apostle. And he says, I am an apostle of Christ Jesus. So in other words, my, the origin of my ministry, the origin of my work, it stems from the person of Christ himself. Now, not everybody was able to say that. Some received their commission or their calling as if from someone who was a messenger that God had already commissioned in and of himself. But Paul, whenever he says, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ, he's referring back to that experience that he had in Acts chapter 9, whenever he was on his way to Damascus to persecute the church. And God met him there in the person of Jesus Christ. And he asked this question, who are you? And he says, I am Jesus, the one that you're persecuting. And so he was referring to his direct encounter with Jesus. And in that encounter, Jesus told him, I am going to send you as an apostle to the Gentiles. And so here he is. He's writing a letter to the Gentiles, to the Gentile church. And he's saying, based on what Jesus said to me on the Damascus road, I'm establishing for you that what I'm up to and what I'm about is not something that has derived from my own inclinations. It's not something that I've come up with myself. I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. And then he attributes this to the will of God. He says, this is what God has intended. This is God's intention. It is God's intention that I submit this letter to you as someone who is under the authority of Christ and, and, and as, a, as a leader in the church to bring this information to you that you're about to receive. So Paul is declaring that he has, is one who has been divinely summoned and commissioned and called invested with authority, an authority that is not of himself and not from any other human being, but from God through the personal encounter that he had with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this call upon his life imparts two things. It, it, it sends a message that there are two things that, that they need to understand. The first one is this. He's saying to them that because Christ has called and commissioned me, I have the right to address the church. The right to address the church is conferred upon the Apostle Paul. So what he's trying to help them understand is this, that as he speaks to them, as he writes this letter to them, and as he sees them in person whenever and if he does, that he has a right that has been conferred by God upon him to address the congregation of believers to whom he speaks. This is something that God has granted to him. It's something that God has given to him. So Paul wants them to understand that what he says to them is not from himself. It is the message of God. So it speaks to his right to address the church, but it also speaks to his responsibility before God. See, the truth is that as he addresses the church, he is answerable to God for the way that he leads. He's answerable to God for the things that he says. He's answerable to God for the words that he shares. He's answerable to God for the recommendations that he makes to them. So as he begins to write these words, as he begins to pen these words, he's doing this with a sense that God has commissioned him to do so, but also that he is accountable before God for everything that he's going to put down and send to them in order for them to read and try to understand things about the church and things about the Christ of the church and things about the practical mission of the church. 
So he, he's establishing for them that all of this is derived not from something that's in himself, that this is something that God has called him to do. And this is something that God has commissioned him to do. And it's something that he will answer to God for as he makes his way into this ministry. I want you to know that that's heavy. That is a heavy thing. To, to believe in your heart that God has called you to have any responsibility in the body of Christ is weighty. And, and it's important for us not to trivialize the call of God. Whenever he challenges us and calls us up to step up and to serve within the body of Christ, it's, it's important for us not to be dismissive about that. It's important for us to be open to what God wants to do. And it's a heavy thing to say yes to that. But I want to tell you this. Whenever God puts his hand upon the life of someone to be a minister, a, a pastor, a leader at that capacity, the weight becomes very heavy. Because we know that we stand before God and we answer for everything that we say for every suggestion that we make, for every recommendation, for every direction that we point, everything that we do, we know we stand before God. And that's a heavy thing. And Paul knows that. Paul recognizes the weight of the call of Christ upon his life as an apostle. And so he wants them to understand that he knows who he is and he knows what he's, what he's taken up whenever he's accepted and received this call. The role of leadership and the goal of leadership must balance the role of leadership is one that is given by God, and the goal of leadership is always to seek the heart of God and to deliver the message of God and to, pr pr to point the way that God is leading. And so the role and the goal must balance out, and both are strictly under divine oversight every single time. So Paul begins his letter to the Colossians with, by telling them some things about leadership in the church that he thinks are important for them to know. Well, he moves, he moves immediately from that into sharing with them some traits of the church family. And there are five that are mentioned here. He begins there in verse 2. He says, To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Traits of the church family. Very important for us to know. The first one that he mentions is the word saints. He's not talking about a football team. He's talking about the church. He's saying that, that those who are part of the church, those who are believers within the body of Christ, those who have responded to the call of Christ upon their life and said yes to Jesus as their Lord and Savior and surrendered their lives and submitted themselves to His Lordship and, and received the grace of God by belief and trust in His name. He says, you have a new designation now. Not only is there a new name written down in glory, but there's a new designation attached to those who've done this. He says, you're called saints. Now, most people that hear this, they say, well, I don't feel very much like a saint. Because we attribute the idea of perfection to that. We, we think that if someone is a saint, like St. Matthew, St. Mark, St. Luke, St. John, that, 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 that attributes to them some element of perfection. And I can absolutely assure you that if any one of those guys was standing before you this morning, he would be very old. <laughs> Y'all didn't see what I did there, did you? If one of those guys was standing before you and you said, this is a saint, he's perfect, they would say, absolutely not. You better believe I'm not perfect. You better believe that I am flawed, I am human, just like everybody else. So whenever we use that term saint, whenever God uses that word to identify believers, he's not talking about perfection. The word literally refers to being holy in the sense of being set apart. The church is set apart. It's different. It, it means peculiar. It means that you're part of a different society than those who are not believers. You're part of a different group. You're of a different mindset. You're of a different sect, a different segment. You're, you're marked as part of a higher society, if you will, with higher and different values. You have different standards. You don't bend to the secular pressures that would disfigure our resemblance to our Savior. And, and so it's not, some, it's, it's not saying that we're elitist in any sense of the word. It's not saying that we're better than others. It's not saying that we have a right to be judgmental or unkind or even exclusive. 
But it means that we are those who have become excited about our, the, about our adoption as children of God, and we are equally excited about everyone else who comes to the Lord through Christ. And our goal is to model before them the kind of life that God gives us through Jesus Christ and to let that life pour through us out into the world. Saints, holy ones, set apart, different. Is your life identifiably different from the world you're walking through? That's what Paul says that believers in Christ should be. He also then uses the word faithful. He says you're faithful. Those who, who, to whom he writes, he says you're those who are consistently pursuing. You're always pressing in to the things of God. You're determined to be what God wants you to be. You're determined to serve the way God wants you to serve. You're faithful to the calling of Christ upon your life. You're faithful to the life that Christ is calling you to live. You're determined. You're dependable. You're someone that's reliable. The things of God are first and foremost in your life, and you're going to give yourself to that with priority to the things that God lays out in front of you. You're faithful. He then uses the word brothers. This speaks of that familial relationship. This word is repeatedly used and mentioned by Paul as he speaks about the common union that we share with the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that as believers in Jesus, we are family. Now, now family is a good thing for the most part. We, we find that family is a place that we feel like we belong. It's a, it's a place where, where we find acceptance, where we find encouragement, where we find affirmation, where we find love. And, and that's what the church is meant to look like. It's meant to look like this large family, this large, wonderful gathering of those who are in union with Christ. And by virtue of that union, we're in union with each other. We share this relationship. And that relationship is something through which we find this wonderful opportunity to find strength and to be sustained as we move through this world and this life together. So he says we're brothers. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. And we need to be cognizant of that. And we need to be celebratory that we have such a, a wonderful, large family because we are a family. So he says that this is the church. The church is made up of saints. The church is made up of those who are faithful. The church is made up of those who are family. But he says the church is also made up of those who are in Christ. Look at what he says, to the faithful brethren in Christ. This is where he starts speaking about that dynamic union that is the most important designation for any individual. See, the truth is that there's one of two things that's real about your life. You either are in Christ or you're not. There's no other place to be. You're either in Christ or you're not in Christ. And for those that, that, that can be identified as being in Christ, this means very simply that you're a born-again believer. You're someone who's come to faith in Jesus and your life has been transformed. You've, you're regenerate. You're born again. You have new life through the person and work of the Lord Jesus. You've experienced the forgiveness of your sins by belief and trust in the grace of God. And, and, you, and you've become a new individual. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And so that's who we are. And so we are, if we're in Christ, that means that we are in union with him. This, this this deep and abiding union that nothing can sever, nothing can change, and that's the most important designation that an individual can have. And it's the only means for being declared right in the sight of God. If you want to be in a, in a place where you have right standing before God, where God looks at you and says about you that you are right in my sight, you're, you're saved, you're preserved, from an eternity being separated from God, the only way that you can have that is by being in Christ. And you're either in Christ or you're not. you either either in that union or you're not. I want to tell you something. You can be in the church and not be in Christ. Do you know that? You can be a member on every church activity that we have here. You can, be, you can be in Sunday school. You can be in church choir. You can be in children's ministry. You can be a deacon. You can be on the decorating committee or the whatever. You can be a, a member of anything the church has to offer. You can be in church but not be in Christ. But you can't be in Christ and not be in the church. So the question is, are you in Christ? Have you come to that place in your life where you've bowed your heart 
your life, your soul before him and said to him, Lord, I'll, above everything else, I want to be in Christ. I want to be saved. I want my sins to be forgiven. And I want my life to be hidden with God in Christ. I want, whenever God looks at me, for him to look at me and see Jesus. And as he sees Jesus standing before me, he says, you are righteous because Christ has dressed you in the robe of his own righteousness through forgiveness of your sins. You're in Christ. That's what he says to the church. So he says, you're saints, you're faithful, you're brothers and sisters in Christ. You're in Christ and he also says you're in Colossae. Now this was a place. Colossae was a place. And here Christianity in that city would find one of its most severe challenges. This was a large city and it was an old city. And in this city there were a lot of false teachers. And they were urging those who had come, become believers and that they knew about to leave their Christian roots and to turn to paganism, to, to accept the, the, the gods of paganism, to accept the deities that were humanly devised, to, to become what they were, to, to walk away and to leave and to rejoin the world and, and to support the things the world upheld as good and fun and enjoyable and religious and have you ever had that kind of enticement in your life as a believer? See, the truth is that every level of Christianity is lived out in some context. The context for our Christianity is we're in Sherman, Texas, or somewhere nearby. Just like the saints of old were in Colossae, we're in this area. This is our context. And we need to understand our context. Now, Unlike some places in the earth, we don't have idols situated in the streets where people walk by and bow down to these idols in the streets and worship. Uh, we don't live in a place where you can't, you can't uh, butcher a beef because it may be your grandfather. Thank God for that. We don't have to deal with those kinds of things here. That's not our context. I've been to that context, and it is bizarre. It's, 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 it's just so uh, unsettling to me to think about that. And, and, and there, whenever we would talk to people about Jesus, there would be some who would say, no, I can't, I can't accept your Jesus. It's not that I don't believe what you're saying, but if I do, then my life, my family... We will be ostracized, we'll be blackballed, we'll be pushed aside. We'll be no longer received in the culture of our world. We won't have a, be able to make a living and, and, and our lives will be totally changed because that was their context. Our context is different. We live in a world where that we may not be blackballed for our Christianity, but we may be enticed by the world we live in to be a little bit more like the world. To, to kind of blend our Christianity with the worldly values and the worldly system. And, and to, to not look so different, to not be peculiar, to not be identified as some sort of a holy Joe, some sort of a, of a saint. But just, you know, just be normal and, and we'll accept you. We'll, we'll, we'll just walk with you through this world and you don't have any expectations of us and we won't have any on you. You do your thing, we'll do ours. So that's more of the context, I think, that we walk through. It's the world that says, you don't bother us, we won't bother you. That's what it says so far. That could change very easily. So we're, they're in Colossae, which is this city which entices them to come back. So whenever Paul is laying out for them the idea of the church as it should be in this book, he essentially is telling them, there's some things that you need to understand about yourself. You are the saints of God. You're those that are different you're different than the world you're walking through. You're a faithful group of people, and you need to stay faithful to the things of God. You're a family that exists in this larger context of your own culture. You're in Christ, and nothing can take that away from you. And you're in this city called Colossae, and here is where you have to practice your faith and live out your witness and your testimony for Christ. So then he concludes his greeting with what I call some grand truths about the church experience. He tells them a couple of things that they need to understand. 
In the last part of verse 2, he says this, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First thing he says to them is this, As those who are saints, faithful brethren in Christ in Colossae, you are recipients of the grace of the amazing God. Grace to you. He is reminding them that the basis of their new life in Christ is the grace of God. That this was not something that they worked their way into. This was not something that they, that they were able to concoct and devise and develop on their own. But God in His grace, with His great love with which He loved us, extended to us the opportunity to receive full pardon, free pardon, full forgiveness, free forgiveness for our sin and to be made right in His sight, not by virtue of anything that we have done. He writes later, he says, not by works of righteousness that you've done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. And so we understand that it is by God's grace. And I want to tell you what that does. If you, if you get any sense of what that is, that brings humility. That brings us to a place where we understand that there's nothing that we are in Jesus that is deserved by us. But it's all because He loved us so much, and cared so much, and wanted to share eternity with us so much that He extended forgiveness at the cost of the life of His own Son, Jesus. Grace, the basis of our new life in Christ, and the wellspring of the life that continues to flow in us, that never-ending supply of the generous life of Christ that flows in us. It is inexhaustible, and it is wonderful. So he says you're recipients of the grace of God. He also says you're able to live at peace with God. See, the fact is, and we talked about this in our Sunday school class, that, that Scripture says that before we came into a relationship with God where we, are forgiven, where we are forgiven of our sins, that we are at enmity with God. And Scripture says that He overcame that enmity. He made peace with God for us and reconciled us by the blood of His cross. And because of that, we are at peace with God. The absence of a conflict that once existed... The, the absence of a controversy that was present is, is now our reality because of what God has done through Jesus Christ. So, so this is a peace that we have with God where we no longer are at enmity with Him. But it's also a peace that we have from God that is of God. This speaks to a calmness that's able to settle in upon our soul. It, it's, a, it's a sense of well-being that allows our souls to be at rest and to be able to have confidence that we are right with God and that, that our world is okay because we are in a right relationship with God. Because there's no more enmity, we're reconciled to Him by the death of His Son. So we're able to live at peace with God. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that, we're filled with the presence of God. We are ever in the presence of God. See, we, we think longingly and rightfully about the time whenever we'll exit this life and, and when we'll be in the presence of our King, our God, our Savior forever and forever. But I want to tell you something. If you're a believer, you're in His presence right now and His presence is in you right now. It's called the Holy Spirit. The person of the Holy Spirit takes up residence in our lives and He dwells within us. And He preserves and protects us and He extends the peace of God to us and He encourages us and He strengthens us and He comforts us and He is the presence of God in our lives. And so we are able to understand that because of Jesus, we are filled with the very presence of God. We are ever in His presence and His presence is ever filling us. Oh yes, it'll be better when we leave all the troubles and the trials and the challenges and the brokenness of this fallen world behind and we don't have to look out on that anymore. We only see the beauty and the perfection of the eternity He's created for us. But He's still with us. Jesus said, I have said to you, I will never leave you and I'll never forsake you. Our God walks with us every step of the journey. He's with us now. So, Paul is trying to begin to help people understand the way the church ought to be what the church ought to look like and what the church ought to look for and what the church ought to look forward to. And so he begins with these expressions. And so I want to say to us in 
kind of wrapping this up, that the pattern that's promoted in the early church provides a model for duplication by the church of today. And that includes some things. First of all, it includes a, an appropriate biblical understanding of leadership. We need to understand that God speaks to us through those that he places in leadership in our lives. He shares his word. He shares his truth. And we all have that. Every one of us has leadership in our lives. I, I try to listen as much as I talk. Maybe not up here, but for the most part, you'll find me trying to listen and learn. Uh, my, my grandfather that I've told you about so many times, he taught me a poem whenever I was small. He said there was a wise old owl, old owl that lived in an oak. The more that he heard, the less he spoke. The less he spoke, the more he heard. We ought to try to be like that wise old bird. And that's not a bad idea. We, we all want to share our opinions, but sometimes we just need to listen and learn from those who have been maybe down a road that we haven't been. Maybe those who've had an experience we haven't had. Maybe those who've obtained knowledge that we haven't had access to or opportunity to learn. We all need to, to listen to those who are able to lead us whenever God speaks to us through them. Secondly, we need to have a correct perspective of roles and responsibilities throughout the church. If we are who Scripture says we are, then that places upon us a weight of responsibility. Every one of us walk through this world, and mark my words, people know, people know where you go on Sunday. People know where you go. And they may watch you come here on Sunday, but I want to tell you something. They're watching you a whole lot more on Monday than they are on Sunday. And they're watching you a whole lot more throughout the week to see if where you go on Sunday makes any difference on who you are on Monday. And so we need to understand that we, we carry within us the, the seal of the Holy Spirit of God. We're sealed by Him. And the world watches us to see if we're accepting the roles and responsibilities as believers as we make our way through this world. The last thing I would say is that as believers, we need to understand a realization of all that we've received from God. Oh, listen, the, 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 the wonder of what He's done for us through His Son, Jesus, ought never cease to amaze us. It ought never to cease to excite us. It ought never to cease to humble us. It ought never to cease causing us to respond energetically, passionately to God with our lives. Wherever we are, if, if you have occasion to talk to anybody about God, there ought to be some life in that conversation. There ought to be some excitement and exuberance from you as you speak about this, this God who loves us so much that he did all these wonderful things for us and gifts us with all of these wonderful realities that is who we are because of Christ. Whenever we come to the house of God and, and we begin to, to meet together, to experience the dynamic of family gathering, there ought to be some life in that. There ought to be some joy in that. There ought to be some celebration in that. There ought to be some exuberance in that. We ought to be able to find ourselves giving glory to God with excitement and, and because He's praiseworthy. He's worthy of us reaching down inside of ourselves and being awakened in our soul and in our spirit to give Him honor and glory that He deserves. This is who you are if you're the church. It's who you are. Now the question is, are you part of the church? Are you in Christ? Do you know that you know that you know that you've been born again and that your life is hidden with God in Christ, that you're saved, that, that everything about your life is sealed by the Holy Spirit because you're born again? Do you know? This morning. If not, I want you to know that God has a place for you. He has a place for you and He has a, an, an opportunity for you right here today to say yes to Jesus, to trust Him as your Savior, to be forgiven of your sins, to have your name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life, in, in the indelible blood of the Lord Jesus, where you, where you will remain forever and forever. Just trust Him. Trust what He did on the cross as for you. Come to Him. Surrender your heart, your life, your will to his lordship and to his great forgiveness and salvation. In a few moments, we're going to give you an opportunity to respond to the message that God's brought today. 
And as you respond, as you respond in your heart, I pray that you'll just be obedient to him, that you'll listen carefully to whatever he's prompting you to do, and that you'll just do it. Today, that may mean that you need to come to Jesus. You may need to come to a place where you say, I've not really been saved. I, I, I may have been in the church, but I've not been in Christ. And today, I want to be, be saved. I want to know that. I want to know that when I leave this life, that I'm going to be with God forever. Would you come to one of our ministers here in just a moment and share with them that you need to know how you can be saved? And we'll be happy, happy to help you with that. Now, you don't have to do that. You, you can be saved without us because we're just, we're just people who are trying to point you to the, the way, which is Jesus. But if you need that help, please don't hesitate. We would love to help you with that. Maybe there are other things that God's laying on your heart. Maybe whatever it is that, that you need to do to take care of some things, he's here to invite you to be that, that substantial part of his church where you're right with God and things are right between you and him. Today, maybe you need to just meet him at the altar and pray and say, Lord, I want to be, be a part of that vibrant, dynamic body where Christ is Lord and where he's Lord of my life. I'm going to ask you to stand with your heads bowed. I'm going to lead us in prayer. Our ministers will be down front. And after I pray, there will be some music playing just for a few minutes. And as that happens, if you need to come, if you need to come today to, to inquire about what it means to know Jesus or what it means to be a part of this church, or any other thing that God is, is, is working in your heart about, please know that we're here to help. Lord, I ask you today, would you speak to us now? Would you please speak to us? Would you, would you make us aware of exactly what you're saying in our own hearts? And Lord, if there's anybody here today that has not yet said yes to Jesus, I pray that in these very moments that their heart will be awakened and stirred that they will come to Jesus right here, right now. And if there are other decisions that need to be made or other questions that need to be answered, please, please help us not to be timid. Help us not to wait, just simply to come as we wait before you now in Jesus' name. You come as we wait. You come as God speaks to you.